Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new Take Aim. As always, pumped to get a new show out to you guys and always excited to talk with my good buddy Brian Broderick from Day 6 Gear. And uh, Brian was just down actually hunting with one of my other very long time friends, Gotti Hamble from Top O Texas Outfitters on an Audad hunt. And I think there's nothing more kind of uh, just the creme of the crop when it comes to a challenging bow hunting trophy. And it's a uh, literally up there on the list of my uh, absolute dream hunts to do with the bow and arrow so uh, congrats to Brian on awesome success on such a great animal and uh, I can't wait to do it myself so I hope you guys enjoy this show All right, guys, we are back. Brand new take game and excited, as always, to get a new show out and excited to uh, once again talk with my buddy Brian Broderick from Day 6 Gear. What's happening, Brian? Hey, how you doing, Brandon? I'm uh, uh, glad that you're one of the few podcast hosts that actually gets our name right. <laughs> Which Everybody one? Everybody calls it Six Arrows. It's Day 6 Gear. <laughs> day 6 Gear, that's right. So, <laughs> but... Uh, well, let's start with that real quick, Brian. What's going on with uh, Day 6 Gear and, and uh, anything new coming down the pipeline? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we're uh, selling the absolute crap out of arrows uh, and uh, just overwhelmed and blessed and happy to be doing it. And uh, uh, we're finishing up our uh, broadheads uh, and going to be releasing those May 1st and um, uh, been running some Test heads through a few critters here and there, and super excited about getting them out there. Can you uh, explain a little bit, Brian, of what kind of broadheads they are? Yeah, it's a um, it's a it's a two blade uh, with a bleeder. Um, it's basically the, uh, the culmination or, or hybridization of, of uh, Aaron Snyder and I's favorite three heads uh, that we've shot over the years, and we've just kind of took the best attributes of what we liked of each one, and then took the negatives away from what we didn't like about them and just kind of used that as a base to, to start a design. And then, um, you know, we had some target sizes and target weight uh, all while maintaining uh, solid blades and not having any vented blades, so they'll be really quiet. Um, and uh, that's it. I mean, that's kind of, you know, what, what, we, uh, what we did and used as a starting point to kind of get where we are. I got you. So uh, offhand, Brian, what are you going to have available as far as um, grains go? So I would assume you're going to have like a standard 125, or are you going to have 100 as well? Yep, we are. That was the challenge was the 100. Um, I figured. But we got it worked <laughs> out. So uh, we just had to incorporate, you know, titanium ferrules and things like that, which is super expensive, unfortunately. But, you know, you, you can't let an obstacle stop you from what you want, what people want. So We've got a, the, a head that is an inch and a sixteenth wide, um, and it's it's going to be available in a hundred grain solid and one twenty five solid, uh, and they both have bleeders. They're virtually identical, other than the material that we use for the um, the ferrule. Uh, they're going to be interchangeable blade, uh, so you can change the main blade out very easily in the field. Um, not everyone is uh, astute at uh, sharpening blades, and certainly not out on a hunt. So. We wanted to make it really easy where, you know, if a guy was on a on a backpack hunt or even, you know, any kind of hunt and uh, took some shots and wanted to change the blade out, he could just have some extra blades to do that. Um, and then we're uh, going up uh, a little bit in size uh, to a head that I really wanted, um, which is an inch and a quarter wide uh, blade, uh, main blade, and it'll be uh, a 125 and a 150. Um, and then, uh, then we got a big old honking trad head that Aaron wants. So, um, and it'll be, I believe, 200 and 250, wow. um, all solid. So, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's been pretty challenging, you know, getting these, getting these heads made. I didn't realize how difficult it would be, but, um, we've worked through it and, and, um, got what we wanted, didn't settle for, settle for anything. And that would have made it the easy path if we would have settled for certain, you know, readily available materials and blade designs and things like that. But we knew that if we didn't do exactly what we wanted, we wouldn't be happy. And I just wasn't going to do it unless I could get exactly what I wanted. If, if I couldn't make a, a, you know, kind of a um, pretty significant difference, uh, an improvement, 
uh, it just wasn't worth it wasn't worth doing to me. So we just kind of pushed and stuck to our guns and finally got it. You know. Yeah, I would assume with multiple heads and when you're changing those the weights of those heads, it, it's got to change that design on that head, so, so to speak, um, to make all these parts work. So I, I, it does. It's a, yeah. it's a total match. The total math thing, uh, you know, uh, you know, you get a head design perfect for the hundred, and then you change the ferrule to, um, you know, you change the ferrule to um, um, stainless and it throws all the weights off. So then you've got to go back and adjust and adjust the first one, change the blade size, then come back, adjust again. It's just uh, uh, kind of a pain in the butt to be honest with you. Yeah, for sure. I bet uh, the, um, the head itself, Brian, it, if if you can talk about it before it's out yet, but is the bleeder yeah. blades part of the head? Is it a solid piece, or are those uh, like something we can change in and out? No, you can change the bleeder as well. Uh, so when you you know buy replacement blade packs for these heads, it'll come with a replacement main blade and a replacement bleeder. Um, so uh, you know you can uh, change them all out at one time. Gotcha. Well, that sounds yep. very interesting. Yeah, very cool. Well, I assume that uh, you guys just used these heads or prototypes of the head, and you guys had punched a couple we odd heads <laughs> in uh, Texas pan- Panhandle a couple weeks ago, and I was really excited to talk with you about that today and, and uh, kind of both things, see how the heads worked on the odd ad and, and talk about the details of the odd ad hunt because I know personally between – I mean, both of us personally, we're a huge fan of odd ads, and, and we kind of rank that odd ad up there as one of the best and most significant animals you can kill as a bow hunter free range. Yeah, I um I ran across my first odd ad uh, on a hunt in West Texas. Gosh, it would have been in the, oh, I don't know, mid, let me just make sure I get this right, mid to late 90s maybe, and I ran across some odd ad out there on a West Texas hunt, and man, I just... I don't know. I was just completely smitten with them, and and um, back then the the ranchers really weren't aggressively hunting them because you know the the herds were just kind of getting established, and and uh, you know they were not really wanting to get after them, and and now they have just completely you know they have just totally thrived in that country, and um, and you know they've got a great established population now, and and the country that they inhabit. <clears throat> excuse me, is as golly, it's as rough and rugged as anything you'll ever want to hunt. Um, so uh, it just makes it a pretty good, pretty good challenge. And, of course, they have, you know, uh, they're a sheep, so they have that type of, of eyesight um, with some type of magnification in their sight. I'm not sure what. Uh, but they're they're tough to get up, up on with a bow, and um, they, they, don't, they don't stand around and wait for, um, like, a second look. You know, they're not like a deer where a deer will look back to be kind of make sure what he saw. These things just bug out. <laughs> you know, they, they uh, if, if, if one leaves, they all leave, you know. The look and they're gone. But another thing that makes it really challenging, too, is they're always in a group, right, Brian? Like you're you're looking at sometimes 15 to 30 sheep probably in a in a one group when you get up to glass on them or, or make a stalk. So you're then trying to get past 60 set of eyes that, like you said, have ma- magnification, so it makes it just super challenging. It does, and it, it's, uh, um, I learned a lot of lessons, uh, you know, when we were out there a few weeks ago, uh, and, um, you know, I tried to push the issue in the beginning a little bit and try to maybe move a little more on groups than I, I probably should have, um, but I quickly learned that it's uh, it, it's a timing game. It's an ambush game. You know, you've got to stay engaged with them because they they'll they can move really fast when they decide to relocate. And so you got to stay up with them and um, and and just kind of lay back and watch as to see what they're doing. And then you're constantly trying to figure out how do I get, you know, how do I find a spot where I can get ahead of them and have everything in my favor, you know, cover wind, et cetera, um, and then limit, you know, how they're going to spread out to where you can kind of concentrate them inside a bow range. So what I started doing was just kind of sitting back on them and watching, and then once I, you know, saw them get into a point to where I thought they were heading into an area that would provide a good ambush uh, scenario, we would wait for them to get out of sight and then make 
big, big loops through canyons, basically running to get up ahead of them and try to get, uh, you know, in a position before they, you know, got out where they could see you. And then, of course, you're playing the wind, too, uh, and those canyons kind of uh, are a kick in the ding-ding when it comes to playing wind because they just, it's constantly changing around. <laughs> yeah, Fortunately it for is. us, it, it was blowing 30 to 50 the whole time we were there. So that it was a huge key to our success as we had, you know, wind cover for smell and as well as um, uh, some sound uh, cover. Sound. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, so, and, it, and it helps with movement cover too because there's a lot of movement in the in the underbrush and all that, you know. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does for sure. Now I know, uh, and I wanted to give credit where to do. You were hunting with one of my good buddies as well, Scotty Campbell, at his place at Topple Texas Outfitters in the Panhandle. And like when you got there, Brian, I, I assume Scotty kind of had a game plan. Was it just like let's get the glass out or let's get to a high vantage point and then start glassing or well, how did you guys start the hunt? Yeah, I mean, that was it. I mean, it was. That was it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we. I got there Saturday around noon. It took a couple hours to get to him. And, you know, we anticipated, uh, you know, getting unpacked, getting settled where we were going to stay, shooting the bows a little bit, and starting hunting Sunday. And as soon as we pulled up, Scotty said, man, y'all are here in great time. Grab your crap. Let's go. Let's go hunt right now. And I, I thought, man, I am cold. This is my kind of guy. So we literally <laughs> did. We literally did a parking lot change, like you know NASCAR pit crew uh, pit stop, and yanked out bows, got everything ready, threw on clothes, strapped on boots, took two shots at targets, jumped in the truck, and took off. And you know it was an hour and a half drive up to where we were going. And you know most outfitters are not going to go do that. They're not going to drive that far to go hunt two hours. Yeah, for uh, sure. That's right. But got it. Scotty was ready to roll, so uh, we got up there first day, got up high where we could laugh, and literally the next ridge uh, to the east of us, or northeast of us, uh, there were sheep all over it. I mean, they were within, I don't know, 800 yards of us, and uh, fortunately, uh, Wes, Scotty's son, spotted them before we kind of gave ourselves up, and uh, so, you know, we were all kind of discussing, you know, what to do, and I said, man, look, we got, we got an hour. I told Aaron, Let's go. So we grabbed our bows and took off. And um, believe it or not, I ended up getting a shot off that day, and Aaron almost did too. <laughs> so, Gosh, uh, dang, in the first evening. First evening, yeah. But, but you know, the bad thing is, is I, I pushed it real hard going down this, this, this hillside or mountainside. And, you know, going down is, is almost worse than climbing. And um, I don't know, about right when I got to the bottom, you know, you, you know my history. I've I, you know, got some injury issues from a bad accident, you know, years ago. And um, my left knee is always problematic. And it, it, I messed something up really bad, uh, like the first drop we made. And, uh, but I just kind of like hobbled on one leg because I could see some sheep up the canyon. And I, I ended up getting up there and, and um, they were in a, uh, like a 20 foot deep, maybe, you know, 100, 100 foot wide uh, creek bed, dry creek bed. And they were, you know, six dead cottonwoods right up on the edge of the bank, so I had a little cover. So I belly crawled up, wind in my face, came up over the edge. The sheep were below me. Everything was great. Uh, I was waiting for them to – they were feeding into the wind, which was perfect. They were feeding to my left, and uh, I was waiting for them to feed out to get a shot. They were between 20 and 30 yards. And I couldn't believe how close I'd gotten right off the bat. And but it was just that perfect scenario. It was pure luck that they were there and I could get there quickly. And anyway, long story short, I had one feed out in the open. I was about to shoot it. And then I noticed that the sheep behind it was a giant old ram. And I thought, man, I, I just, these things are too chill. Everything's good. I'm going to wait for that ram to feed out. And when I did, you know, I was sitting there waiting, um, you know, 30 seconds later, I heard something coming up the canyon. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I looked, and there was like 200 head of cattle running up the creek bed full speed like a stampede coming to me, um, and they ran the sheep out. Well, 
right when I got to my position, I arranged everything, and there was a, a trail going up the far bank of that washed-out creek, and I ranged it, and it was exactly 60 yards. So as soon as the, the, the cattle came stampeding up, the sheep started running. So I immediately turned my bow up to, you know, I dialed my sight to 60 and said, hey, if they go up that side over there and they stop, at least I'll know exactly where they are. Right. If they stop anywhere else, I'm just not going to shoot, you know. Um, and the whole herd, there was about 30 of them, they literally went up that bank and stopped and looked back at me, and I was already drawn. As soon as they started running, I set my sight and drew, and I thought if they stop on that bank, I'm going to be ready. And I was watching one big ram, and I watched him go all the way up, and uh, he stopped wide open. They looked back and saw me, and I thought, okay, they see me, they're going to react when I shoot. So I held my pin, like, below their chest. Uh, so I guess it's the whitetail guy in me. I always yeah, for sure. Drop, it's just you know? the natural instinct. Yeah. And so I thought, man, these things are going to all, with that many eyes, they're going to freak when I shoot. And I shot, and literally not a single one of them batted an eye. They didn't flinch. They didn't do anything. And I shot right through the, the, the hair uh, on that one, and they ran off. And come to find out, uh, Aaron was trying to get around them and spooked that herd of cattle and ran the cattle up the the, um, the draw at me and ran the sheep off. So once that was done, I looked up and I could see him walking out. I came walking up there and he had his head down. He's like, yeah, I kind of effed that up. I'm like, it's all right. <laughs> they won. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no way. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty fun. So it was a pretty exciting, you know, first afternoon, you know. Yeah, it actually doesn't get much more exciting than that. Yeah, so uh, you want me to just kind of keep going through the progression? Yeah, just let us have it. All right, let you have it. Okay, all right. So um, so the next day we went back up to that place and uh, got on sheep early. Um, I laid back, uh, and it was kind of sitting up high with Scotty and Aaron and, and and uh, uh, John that, that works with, with uh, Scotty, they uh, they made a move on some sheep, and Aaron got a couple of shots off, um, but didn't connect, and they all kind of ran up over this mountain. So we came back and, and um, sat down and was, you know, having lunch and all after that morning, and we were watching on the skyline, and we could see sheep starting to filter back into this canyon from where they had run earlier that morning, and they kept, like, dropping off out of sight behind this this little knoll, so we went up there and peeked over the knoll, Aaron and I did, and, and John, that works for, for Scotty, and Scotty laid back to, to glass, and there were sheep there. There was maybe a dozen sheep already in this bowl feeding, and so by this time, my knee was completely shot. I'd already walked three or four miles that morning on one leg, basically hobbling, and um, of course, they're all making fun of me. And um, Of course. Yeah, and so I said, hey, I'm going to sit right here. I got the wind in my face. They act like they're wanting to come back down in this canyon, and if you guys want to make a big loop, go ahead. So they made a big loop, and Aaron actually got a shot off um, and, 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 and hit one, and it was hit good, but it was hit too far back. And um, so we tracked it all the way till dark, and we could keep eyes on it, but we just couldn't ever get close enough for a follow-up. So it was going to get down to uh, 8 degrees that night with like a negative something wind chill. And, and it was going to snow, and so we just pulled out of there. We came back the next morning, and we could not find that sheep. There was fresh snow everywhere. Um, you know, we just could not pick it up. And um, we looked until um, about 1130, and uh, all of us, uh, even Wes, Wes um, Scotty's sons, there were five of us looking. We looked till 1130 for that sheep. Uh, uh, Two of us put eight and a half miles on our boots, and Aaron was over 12. Um, we finally came back to the spot where uh, the, we had last seen the sheep, and somehow or another, we just didn't see the sheep. It was real tucked in, and but Aaron crossed um, some coyote tracks, and so he followed them and followed them straight to the sheep, but the sheep was still alive. Um, and it ran up the canyon, and Aaron, basically, we followed that sheep for another two miles and finally got in on it, and Aaron got another arrow, and it killed it. So we ended up killing that sheep 24 hours after he had initially shot it, and we basically did not stop on that sheep after it was shot in daylight hours until we recovered it. So 
it was a it was an incredible track job. It was an incredible um, you know effort by everybody. It was a shame you know that the sheep you know suffered like that, but it's part of bow hunting and and you know I, you've got to put in the effort to to make it right. You know that's kind of what we did. So yeah, I'm for um, sure you guys did. Amazing that uh, Aaron kind of uh, made the connection between the coyote tracks and, and getting back on that sheep, which is absolutely mind-blowing. Well, you know, the, I'm sure the coyotes could smell smell the, the wounded sheep, and, uh, you know, they're probably going to check it out. For and, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and we probably ran the coyotes out when they were trying to make a play on it, you know, right, because we were there at daylight. And uh, so it all just kind of worked out. We got real lucky, and... Um, uh, anyway, we, we, you know, we recovered that sheep, and that's the first one I've ever put my hands on. Uh, I've seen them over the years, you know, hunting out in West Texas uh, for mule deer, um, but that's the first one I ever put my hands on, and, man, I, I was just Pretty neat. blown away. Yeah, man, I mean, just they're so unique, and so, they're so big. I didn't realize how big they were. Uh, you know, they're built a lot like a mountain goat, you know. Yeah, they're real similar body wise. It looks like they're, uh, which I would assume they have to be. They got super thick kind of bones and legs, you know, so they don't snap off. I would assume, you know, walking all those jagged rocks. It, I've seen them on some of the most strangest places, you know, uh, you would think to ever see an animal. And uh, but man, you're right, Brian. They just look like they're extremely well built and uh, amazing how like agile they even look for being the way they're built well that is a great that's a great term uh agile because when aaron shot his sheep that sheep came right by me um and saw me turn and basically went off of a cliff and and literally you know just like touched its hoof like three times on the on you know going down the sheer face of a 40 50 foot drop and it never checked up i could not believe the agility of that big animal uh, it was just amazing to see, and then, of course, as we hunted throughout the week, we got to see a lot of that, and, um, man, it was uh, it was impressive. So so we recovered that sheet, uh, you know, spent the rest of the afternoon, um, you know, uh, skinning that sheep out and processing it, and, um, and so the next day we went back up there again, and... Um, it looked like, you know, as much as we, as much time as we'd spent in that big canyon, we had pushed them out. And, you know, you're talking about maybe a 10,000 acre ranch that we were hunting on. Um, That's big. Yeah. <laughs> That's but, big to push something yeah, out of there. Yeah, when you've got to cover so much ground, uh, I think we just moved them, and there's so much rugged country everywhere, it was just easy for them to relocate. So, Scotty told us, he said, look, guys, I've got some more places up here we'll go, we'll go hit. He said, but I'll, he said, I have got a place that is almost three hours south of here. And we would have to go pack up, drive down there, um, and, you know, get a motel room down there and get set up to hunt this other property. But it is the most beautiful place you'll ever see. Uh, it was in the Paladura Canyon, which is a, just this gigantic canyon down south of Amarillo. And so... We and for people that good. don't know, let me interrupt one second, Brian. For people that don't yeah. know, it's the second largest canyon in the U.S. next to the Grand Canyon. So just, you know, put that to put that in perspective, it's got to be a pretty piece of ground you guys are hunting on. Yeah, I, I, di I did not know that, but now I do. So that's yeah. a great little tidbit there. But um, so, yes, yeah, so we go down there and we get off on the we're, – we're hunting the top rim – of the canyon um, uh, on this just ginormous piece of property. I don't know how many tens of thousands of acres this, this piece of property was, but it was the most rugged thing I'd ever seen. And, I mean, there literally was – there was no dropping off into the canyon. I mean, you could get to the edge of it and look down, but you were not getting down there. And so, um, you know, if we would have – uh, killed a sheep that had gone down in there, we would have had to, like, totally leave, go out, go around, you know, 20, 30 miles, come in another way through another property, come up through the canyon, then hike in back to where we were. So we were trying to be very conscious of where we were going to hunt so we didn't have a sheep that, you know, got into a place that was going to be impossible to get to. So we hunted some areas 
that were, I don't know, I guess it would be maybe a mile or two from the rim, maybe a mile from the rim of the canyon. So we felt like, you know, we, we had a good enough distance there that we wouldn't get in trouble. Right. Um, You'd get your animal so, out safely. Yeah. And, you know, you, you got to think about that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you know, we're, sure. riding with, yeah, we're riding with the rancher and, and um, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, um, seeing sheep everywhere. You know, now we're trying to figure out where we're seeing them. Are they accessible? You know, uh, how would we make a play on them? Uh, we're seeing mule deer everywhere, whitetails everywhere, hogs everywhere, and we're looking at Scotty going, yeah, you did not oversell this. You undersold it. I mean, this place is paired no over with Yeah. So we were fired up, and so after that, it was we had three more days, and it was game on, and, and we were in the sheet every day, all day, Um I can't remember how many shots Aaron had, but he had a lot of shots. Uh, so he kind of went to one side of the ranch. I went to another uh, so we wouldn't mess each other up. And um, anyway, I, you know, I had a lot of different opportunities on, on some decent sheep, you know, decent-sized sheep. But I, I had told myself I was just going to shoot the first one I had an opportunity at. But when we got to that new place, man, the, some of the rams we were seeing were just like, they were amazing animals, and I really wanted to try to, to, you know, get an opportunity at one of those really big ones. And so I held out probably more than I should, um, but uh, I just really wanted to have an opportunity at one of those big ones. And so we hunted three more days, and, and uh, the last day we started on a, on a herd of sheep and bumped them, and they ran, I don't know, about a mile. Uh, you can see a long way out there. And uh, John that I was hunting with said, hey, man, he could see it in my eyes. I mean, I was hurt. And I've been hobbling around these canyons and mountains, you know, for five days now. And, and um, so anyway, he said, look, you just walk straight up this ridge about a mile and it'll hit the road. We were about three miles from the truck and we had to go through a canyon. He said, I'll go back through there, get the truck. I'll drive around and pick you up up there on that. And that'll be a lot easier walk for you. And I said, man, I appreciate it. So um, so I started that, and I was blasting to where those sheep went, and they stopped. And they were about a mile away, and they got in these thick, thick cedars, and I thought, man, that is the spot to get one if I'm going to do it. And it was the very last day. John's already walked. He's gone. I'm like, crap, I'm going. So I hobbled my butt over there. Well, I didn't realize there was a giant canyon between me and them. I couldn't see. So I had to drop down in one, hand crawl out of another one, uh, I finally got into the sheet, and they were all around me. Those are probably about 80 to 100 in this group. And um, and how close are you yeah. now, Brian, to them? Oh, I, I mean, I've got some at 30 yards, and I've got some at 100, but I can't get close to any of the real big ones. And so um, and finally I bump them, and they, and they push out again, but they didn't really know what I was. They just got nervous, and, and they pushed out on this big rim on this knife edge, and so I eased out there, and I got within 200 yards from them, and it was like on the face of the moon. There was no cover, no nothing. And I laid down out there behind a little brush pile, and I glassed them from, this is probably like 10 o'clock. Uh, I sat there and watched them feed until, uh, I guess, about 1.30. And it was blowing 30 to 40, 11 degrees. I mean, I was an icicle. and um, Freezing freezing and so finally they feed out and they feed around the point of that knife edge you know ridge and um i'm thinking man well they've got to come up the other side and the wind's perfect uh it's in my face coming up the other way they're going to be coming downwind at this point they're like a mile away and i said crap i gotta go so i got up hobbled down to the left side of that ridge and ran up. And I stopped about, I don't know, maybe a half mile from them in glass, and I couldn't see them, so they were still on the back side of that ridge. And But I noticed that where they were coming, off to my left was a big canyon and a big washout that came way up on the side of the, of the ridge. And it was going to basically be a pinch point to where they would have to go around that. 
you know, or it was a 200-foot drop, you know, so they were definitely going to go around that. So I took off again, hobbled down there, and by the time I got to that place, I basically got there at the same time they did. And I was right. They were having to go around it. And so I crawled through the cedars, got on the edge of that, that washout, and crawled up as, as far as I could and, um, and finally ran out of cover. And the sheep were all feeding by me at about 60 yards, which is it's just way out of my range normally uh, as far as taking a shot on an animal. And so I, I just kept watching, kept watching, and I kept talking myself into it because I'd been taking 60-yard shots all week on, like, you know, targets, jackrabbits, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. Right, right. I, I felt really good. Um, so I just waited, and the very last sheep to come through was this just giant old ram. I'd been watching him, and he was the last one. And he was dead on the trail, dead at 60. I knew that they did not react at the sound of a bow uh, the way, you know, from our, from our very first day. So I knew that it, they weren't really jumped the string. The thing's totally relaxed. Wind's blowing, a lot of cover. So it's blowing right in my face. So um, anyway, I went ahead and, and took the shot and, 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 and got him. I hit him back and hit him, I guess, back long uh, front of liver. And he ran about 30, 40 yards and, and laid down. And, I mean, that, that was it. And, and at this point, I start, I'm on top of this mountain, and I'm looking back, and I can see this tower where we had parked the truck that morning at daylight. And I realized how screwed I was <laughs> and how far away <laughs> I was and how many uh, canyons that I would have to cross. And I also realized that nobody knew where I was. Right, which is and, not uh, a comfortable feeling either. No, it was a bad deal, man. So I went over there and checked the sheep out and just was just kind of overwhelmed because I had struggled so much with my knee the whole week. And anyway, it turns out I had torn my meniscus or something. And it had been damaged before, but it finally, you know, crapped out on me. But um, so anyway, I, I, I hobbled up to the top of this ridge and back to my south, I could see a windmill. And so uh, I walked to that windmill and when I got to that windmill, I actually got cell service, which we hadn't had cell service anywhere. Wow. I got cell service. My phone starts vibrating. Everybody's wanting to know where I am. Scotty and Aaron are back. Everybody's looking for me. And uh, so anyway, uh, I finally text and says, here's where I am. Come to this windmill. Scotty knew where it was, of course. But, I mean, it was like a, you know, a 45-minute drive for them to get around to me. No kidding. Uh, yeah. So anyway, they came around and got to the windmill, and then we went up there and packed the sheep out, and uh, and uh, it was just a great wrap up to the last day. You know, it was um, it was it was tough on me just because of my physical limitations, but um, you know, just on that trip. But those animals are as tough a critter as I've hunted anywhere on the planet um, to get a bow shot on, uh, as far as a free range on that. I mean, they're just they, they've got their act together, man. It is it is very impressive. Yeah, for sure. I know, I mean, it is just on my list of a, um, which it, I don't really want to say I have a list of animals I want to or need to kill, but it, it's way up there on a on just a pedestal, so to speak, of just being a, a hardcore bow hunter. I just think it's so worthy of, like, that challenge. And everybody I've ever talked to has just had a uh, hunt similar to yours, Brian, where it's just, it's it's demanding. And I think that uh, it just makes a unique uh, adventure and a really good time if you're, uh, you know, into just doing what you did, grinding it out with one leg for five days. Yeah, Aaron kept making fun of me. He said I looked like I'd been shot in the leg with uh, uh, with rock salt, like trying to rob a chicken coop or something. Because uh, I was just hopping around on one leg. But uh, you know that 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 animal is 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 super unique and and it's just i don't know it's always been um i don't know i've been fascinated with them and you know and that's probably the only sheep of any kind that, that i'll ever hunt um you know I, I have just never struggled with the um uh you know the decision on whether to spend the big bucks to to go after the the sheep um, yeah i mean that is it, one it, cool thing about those sheep right it's a uh so to speak, affordable, and it's in very hard, rugged country, so you're getting 
kind of the best of both worlds, if you ask me. And it's one of the only sheep that obviously in North America here that looks the way it looks. You know, it's got that, that those big, beautiful eyes, a huge mane, and, and the way those horns wrap underneath the chin. And, you know, and, and some get absolutely huge, like the one Brian got is what, Brian? It, it's it's north of 30 was, inches, right? Yeah, it was big. And, it, yeah, they're just amazing. But I don't know, man. I just, um, you know, I, I, I felt like there were times in my life, and, and, and now as I'm getting later on in age and more comfortable, I mean, I felt like I could afford to go do some of these, you know, bigger sheep hunts. It may be a doll or something like that, but I just, I, I, I've just, I don't know. I've never felt comfortable taking that type of money uh, and spending it on something just for me. Uh, I don't know. It just feels really selfish, and and uh, um, I, I understand just feel like that I, completely. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like I'd be taking away opportunities from my family to do things, um, and, uh, and and my family wouldn't care. My boys, my wife, they, they'd be all for it. Uh, and, you know, it probably wouldn't change our life, you know, making that kind of expenditure on a one hunt, but I just could, never could bring myself to do it. And, you know, maybe – uh, when I get a little older and, you know, my kids are, they have their old families and I feel like, you know, everybody's in good shape, you know, it, it may be a point in my life where I'll say, okay, I'll go spend, you know, twenty or $30,000 uh, on a, on something for me. But I don't know, man, I just can't, I can't bring myself to do it right now, you know? No, I understand. I, I feel like, uh, for one, I agree with you a hundred percent on the reasons why not to. And I also kind of think too that I have such a good time hunting deer mule deer and a chance to hunt a awdad and a couple other things that are relatively way down the price scale that I just think can keep me busy and keep me happy so to speak yeah well I like to do a lot of hunts as you can tell um, <laughs> yeah you know we we, we 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 don't let the uh grass the, the, the moss grow under our our feet very often and you know I just felt like if I do a big hunt like that, you know, it's going to limit me from doing six Multiple. other hunts that I want to go do, you know? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I just want to be responsible. So having those sheep available, uh, you know, in that proximity of the country and, and you know, kind of that price point where they're not super expensive, um, you know, it's, it's I don't know. I, I'll tell you right now, I am uh, – I'm afraid that, that it's going to be something I'm going to have to go do every February or March. Um, I, I loved it that much. Yeah, that's super um, cool. Well, I hope next year, Brian, I'll, I'll be going with you if you decide to go because I already told Scotty I'm, uh, I've been threatening for years to come down and do an odd ad with him, so uh, I'm pretty close to doing it either this year or next year. But if you're if you're planning on going again, I'm coming with you. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you a funny story about how this whole thing came together. So. Uh, you and Scotty are friends. I've yep. never, I've never talked to Scotty. Never met him anything. And I'd say, I don't know, maybe the middle of February, he called, uh, looking for some ad- advice and some guidance and some help on arrows, on what to choose for arrows for himself. And so we got to talking, and then I put two and two to get because he told me who he was, but I didn't put two and two together. And then he mentioned you, and then I said, oh. I actually know who I'm talking to now. Right. I, I didn't. <laughs> That's it funny. It took me a while. You know, we were yeah. just talking 20 minutes and just the nicest human on the planet. So we're just talking away and he's like, he said, man, I, you know, I've, I've got some, some decent mule deer out here and I've got some really good white tails and I, I'd love to have you and, and, uh, and your buddy Aaron come out here and hunt uh, deer with me. Um, I would just love it. And I said, man, that I appreciate it, but when it comes to deer season, basically from September through February, I'm pretty much like your your book. On what I yeah. do. huh? I said your book usually. Yeah, I mean it's just like you know, it's it's I, I go do a hunt, come back, work, dig myself out of a work hole, and then get ahead a little bit, go hunt again, and so. You know, I'm constantly going that whole time. I just couldn't really squeeze anything else in. And then it hit me where he was, and I said, Scotty, do you have any, any audad? 
And he goes, heck yeah. And I said, do you like have a huntable amount of all that? And he said, heck yeah. <laughs> and I said, man, he started kind of telling me about the hunting and how they come out of the canyons at night and go up onto these, you know, wheat fields. And yeah. um, so I'm sitting there talking to him. And so I'm, I grab my other phone and I pull my phone up and I look up Amarillo, Texas. And I look at the weather and I look at the forecast for like the next 10 days and like eight days out was um, like, you know, 20 degree low, 50 degree high for like, you know, five days. I was thinking, man, they're going to be hitting that wheat hard with that cold weather. And I said, Scotty, what are you doing uh, next week? In, you know, about a week and a half. And he said, well, maybe we're going to be sheep hunting. And I said, can you pull it off? He goes, I can pull it off. And I'll so literally on that, that quick. same phone call, yeah, never met him anything. An hour later, I'm calling Aaron, and I said, you got to pick me up in Amarillo because he's only six hours from Amarillo where he lives in Colorado. I said, you got to pick me up in Amarillo. I'll fix the book a flight. Here's when we're going. And he's like, oh, man, I've. I've got this to do, and I've got that to do, and I told him what, you know, what the deal was, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to cancel all that. I'll pick you up. So, um, <laughs> anyway, I literally booked a flight right then, and then eight or nine days later, we met Scotty for the first time, and that afternoon, we were shooting a sheep. I mean, that's, that's how quick it went together, and so. That's um, cool. Yeah, and, and Scotty's one of the finest humans I've ever met. Yeah, I second that for sure. He, he's one of the greatest. And uh, I'll be down with him in October for some mule deer hunting. Me and him are going to hunt together for a week. And uh, he's just one of those guys that uh, I think, you know, Brian, every year you kind of look forward just to spending time with somebody. And Scotty's that guy, man. I always look forward to spending time with and hanging out with him and his family. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. And uh, John that works with him, just salt of the earth, his son Wes. I mean, they're just, they're just the greatest folks ever, and, and um, man, they were so accommodating. Um, you know, there's a lot of places I've hunted where the guy really micromanages you, and Scotty would get us in on the sheet and say, all right, there we were, there, you, know, there, you know, we're here, this is as far as we're going to go, and he would just turn Aaron and I loose and let us do our thing, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and walk right behind you and you know, add another person, add more movement, try to tell you guys what to do. You're bow hunting. It, it, it's a, you know, it's a tough deal as it is, so y'all just go do your thing. And that yeah, that's right. Guide. Yeah, you know, that he, is. That, the perfect guide will limit uh, his instruction and his involvement based on his assessment of his hunter's skill set. Because some guys need more help, and some guys don't, and you know, that's a great guide. You know, yeah, he, he really sure. does a good job of evaluating who he's with and, and what he needs to do. And, um, and, and, and golly, man, there's not a lazy bone in that guy's body. He'll he'll walk you to death. Yeah, he's a machine, that guy. So he yeah. is something, yeah. And it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, just a beautiful, beautiful part of the country that a lot of people just don't see. And, uh, and it's a... I mean, what Brian described in this podcast, it really is just an ultimate bow hunting adventure. It's beautiful ground, it's hard hunting, and uh, it's just a piece of the earth that you just don't even think exists until you see it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. I encourage anybody that, that's interested in doing that to go do it because it'll be one of those hunts you'll never forget. And, and uh, I mean, it's it's right up there at the top of my list for sure. And, and um uh, I, I am 100% going to be doing it again one day. Yeah, for sure. Well, super excited to have you on today, Brian, and, and talk about this hunt. I, I couldn't wait to hear about it myself and, and share it with everybody on the podcast side. And uh, super happy that you accomplished an awesome goal and uh, super excited as well that things are going good with Day 6 gear and excited to see these broadheads come out soon. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have to run them through some animals here this fall. No, absolutely. So as everybody knows, you can find Brian, Instagram, Day 6 Gear. Uh, Brian said the new broadheads will be out in May. Was that right, Brian? Yep, or yep. Is it, they'll be out yep, in May. May. Yep. And 
obviously the best hunting arrows on earth are already available so make sure you check out the hd series arrows and uh as well make sure to stop over at topo texas instagram page give those guys a like as well and uh brian can't wait to hear the next hunting story from you man sounds good buddy we'll talk soon all right thanks for your time again and uh, we'll see everybody next week